Right, a familiar passage of scripture, a familiar scripture actually. John chapter three, verse 16. We could probably all do it from verbatim. Reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. For God, let's read it together, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I read it alone, so I read it again solo. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I want you to follow me carefully, carefully today as I preach under God's guidance, the one between the three and the six. Some of you got it. Our text has a three, a one, and a six. Today we're gonna to talk about the one between the three and the six. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We serve a deliberate God, deliberate. And we serve him in a just right universe. Trees give oxygen to us, but we provide carbon dioxide to the trees. We live in a just right universe. The moon governs the Earth's rotation on, on its axis so that we don't drift away. We don't drift off into space. And it controls our tides of the oceans. We live in a just right universe. Somebody did this on purpose. I don't ascribe to a, a, a Big Bang theory, but if there was a Big Bang, somebody did it on purpose. <laughs> Psalm 8 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, not Psalm 8. Psalm 8 says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Earth is a big place, just right for our habitat. Yeah. Earth is a big place. Yeah. And it is the just right distance from the sun, roughly 93 million miles. Slide one. To give us an idea of how large the sun is, the earth, as big as it is, the sun can fit 1,300,000 earths in it. We live in a just right universe. To give you an idea of our galaxy, next slide please. Galaxy Facts, Voyager took this picture of the Earth as it exited our, our solar system. See how minute we look. Galaxy Facts, there are 100 to 4 billion stars in our galaxy but our galaxy is very minute to the universe. We live in a just right universe. Wow. Last slide, the Hubble spacecraft, the Hubble telescope, figures that there are anywhere between 100 to 2 billion galaxies. Did you hear that? And if each galaxy has roughly 
100 to 4 billion stars, it's a big place. In that, God hones in on us. That dot that we saw, he hones in on us. That dot is us. How seemingly insignificant to us, but how important to God. The Bible says, our text today says, for God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave. He gave. We live in a just right universe, on a just right planet. To quote Mufasa from The Lion King, everything exists in a delicate balance, and everything is connected in the great circle of life. And that balance is held together yeah. by one. Yeah. It's held together by one. He gave us a just right universe. We live in a just right world. We live with a just right word. Because the Bible says that, 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 that God gave. And we know that it's a just right word because 40 different writers on three different continents in three different languages tell, all tell the same story. Amen. Oh, y'all that going to help me preach this morning. The Bible says of itself, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Baptist church that all scripture was written by men divinely inspired. And it is the perfect treasure of heavenly instruction that it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter, that it contains the principles by which God will judge us and shall remain until the end of time the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human creeds, conducts, and opinions should be tried. We don't believe the Bible merely contains the word of God. We believe it is the word of God. We live in a just right universe, in a just right solar system, with a just right God giving us a just right word. God in his meandering omnipotence allows us to find truth even in the numeric indicators that organize the scriptures. An example of this is realized when we look at the Ten Commandments. And actually, the Ten Commandments is only a, merely a summary of 613 commandments. Yeah. Because the 613 gave God's law. There were 613 summarized into the Ten. And here, and probably the most familiar scripture Next to Psalm 23, God turns the 613 into a 3, a 1, and a 6. He takes the 613 and turns it around into 316. And it becomes the subject of the law personified. Yeah. Our text highlights a chapter, 3, a verse, 16, which is made up of a 1, and a six. And not to get too much into numerology, but the science of geometria, uh, the Hebrew study of numbers and what they mean, would argue that numbers work for God. Amen. I said numbers work for God. Numbers don't work for us, as in we should not visit Vegas or the local hotspot. <laughs> that would suggest that we believe in numerology. Numbers on their own 
don't mean a thing. Numbers mean something because God gave them permission to mean something. They are a part of his mathematical mesmerization of his divine design. For instance, two is the number of union and division. Four is the number of creation. Said They were said to be four corners of the earth, four gospels, and four creatures around the throne of God. Five is the number of grace. There are five books of Moses. Seven, the number of completion. Seven days a week, seven dispensations, seven seals. Eight, the number of new beginnings. Nine, the number of fruit or potential. Ten, the number of testimony, law, comprehensiveness of, of order. But three would be the number of completeness, smaller than seven, but more vast. Even in the image of God, body, spirit, soul. God himself highlights Father, Son, Holy Ghost. David, the, uh, 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 the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. Jesus had three ace boon coons, Peter, James, and who? John. There are three levels of heaven. The first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. Six would be the number of incompletion. God created the world in six days, but it wasn't complete until he rested on the seventh day. He created man on the sixth day. And there's coming a time when the number of men will be marked as 666. But one. One. O oh, Israel, the Lord, your God is one Lord. We believe in what? One Lord. One faith. One baptism. There is now one mediator between God and man. One name under heaven whereby we must be saved. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. You don't mind if we walk through the text, do you? Four. Four. Before we get into the God part, four. For God always does it for a purpose. There's always meaning behind his actions, his movements. For God so loved, not loves so much. Because if it was love so much, that would be subjective for us to decide and impose on God how much he's lo he should love. But God says, no, 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 I want to be objective. And I'll define my love. I'll define how much I love. For God so loved the world, I define it by as much as I gave. Wow. See, there's no argument there. For God loved the world that he gave. Love is not a feeling, but here it shows itself as a, as a, as a, as a verb. His love matches what he does. He gives. Romans chapter 5 tells us, for God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? His only begotten. His only begotten. The Greek word, the Greek word, the Greek word there is monogene, which means literally one gene. Mono meaning one. Gene, the Greek word for gene. Monogene. You and I have two sets of genes. 23 chromosomes from daddy and 23 chromosomes from mono. But God's monogene only has one set of genes. That's because one day God touched a virgin and she conceived and brought forth a child. And his name was called Emmanuel, God with us. One set of genes. He Undoubtedly looked like Mary.
where he had no earthly father. He had to look like Mary, but he acted like God. Yeah. It's the mystery of what theologians call the hypostatic union. He is not half God and half man, but he is 100% God and 100% man. Every day in the womb, he made the sun come up. Every day in the womb, he said, lion, you'll continue to roar. Every day in the room, womb, he let the earth continue to spin on its axis. On its axis. But God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever, a compound word, who, pronoun, any person, so, an adjective, at any condition, ever, at any time, a noun. One day, time is going to run out. One day, time is going to be up. God is here giving us insurance and assurance that whosoever believes in me shall have eternal life. Pistis, the Greek word for belief, means to direct trust toward someone's life for governing. We ought to direct our trust toward the one, the one and the only one. He will not perish if you trust him. You will not perish because there is insurance. But whosoever believes, pistis, directs their trust toward and governs their lives by the one and the only one will gain everlasting life. Well, I just wanted to stop by Clarksburg Baptist to let you know about this one between the three and the six. He's not half God and half man. He's not only God or only man. He's God and man. Kind of a strange subject for a sermon, but I stopped by to let us know under no certain circumstances that this thing doesn't work without the one. This thing falls apart without the one. Without the one, we are spinning our wheels. Without the one, we are wasting our time. You don't believe the one is necessary? I say, y'all don't believe the one is necessary. Try taking out the one. If you take out the one, you're left with John 3 and 6. Can anybody check what it says? John 3 and 6. Look at what it says. And you'll see how the one is necessary. Oh, Pastor Phil, that's a glorious sound. The pages of the Bible turning in church. Somebody brave enough to read what it says? John 3 and 6. Showing you how the one is necessary. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Without the one, there's total separation from God. But with the one, there is connection. With the one, we have a mediator between God and man. See, the problem was that the wages of sin was death. Not the price of sin, not the cost of sin, but the wage. A wage is something that we earn. And what we earned for our sin was death. Since that's the case, God had a problem. And man had a problem. Because man could die, but man couldn't save. God could save, but he couldn't die. So he needed a God-man. And mama said, if you want something done, do it yourself. So he reached inside of himself and pulled out himself and sent himself through 40 and two generations and he presented himself to the world. 
chapter 3, verse 14 says, and it quotes Numbers chapter 21, verse 9. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And he said, if anyone was bitten by the serpent, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Verse 14, as I said, references this to prove the point that all of us were bitten by the serpent, i.e. the devil's vices or his sin, because there is none righteous. No, not one. The wages of sin was passed on to all of us. But if we look to the one who was lifted on that old rugged cross, if we look to the one, somebody called it an emblem of suffering and shame. I hear the hymnologist writing, I and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. We need the one to close the gap. We need one to speak the language of man and the language of God. For there is now one mediator, scripture says, between God and man. We need the one, y'all, between the three and the six. Last week, last week, last week, my wife got stung by a bee. She said, I hadn't been stung by a bee in over 30 years. And I reminded her when she was stung by the bee that she had actually won. She didn't feel like at the time she won. As her arm began to swell, she didn't feel like she had won. She was on top. But I reminded her that she won because certain bees, when they sting you, they leave their stinger in you, and they have to go off and die. Well, the Bible says that when death stung Jesus, I want to remind us, somebody, that death had to go somewhere and die. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strictness of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need the one, because the one is the sovereign king. By no means of measure can define the, this limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's empirically powerful, empirically powerful. Do you know the one? He's impartially merciful. He is, he is the greatest phenomenon that has ever been crossed in the horizon of the world. He is God's son. He is the sinner's savior. He is the centerpiece of salvation. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of the true theology. Do you know him today? He saves and he strengthens. He sympathizes and he sustains. He guards and he guides. Do you know the one? He's the one. He's the one. Somebody shout the one between the three and the six. He's the one who puts food on our tables. He's the one who puts clothes on our back. His name is Jesus. His nickname is the lily of the valley, bright and morning star. And he shall be called wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. I'm glad I know the one. Are you glad today? I'm glad I know the one. He's the one who loves you, and he's the one who'll never leave you. He's the one who was hung up for our hangups. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He is the one who died on an old rugged cross. But three days later, he got up with all power in his hands. If you know the one today, somebody shout, yeah. Do you know him? Do you trust him? Amen. He's the one between the three and the six. God bless you. Let us all stand. The door of the church is open. We say the door because there is but one door. One. He's the one. 
Our Lord Jesus said, I am the door. I am the one. I'm the door. If any man enters in, he shall be saved. The good news is this. Well, before I give you the good news, let me give you the bad news. If you're without the one, hell is waiting on you. But if you embrace the one, he will save you because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the one shall be saved. Are you here today? Are you here wanting to make a confession to the one? His name is Jesus. We call him Emmanuel. He's the bright and morning star, lily of the valley. His name is Jesus. I'd like everyone to take the time to just make sure that the one is in your heart.